record first, then screen share. Uh, okay, so uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, good to be back with you. Uh, thank you very much for the reminders on posting slides. Uh, they are up there for those who'd like to follow along the lecture um, directly from the slides. We will be going through most of those slides today, but probably not the, uh, the full set. So um, just in terms of the broad arc uh, of this course, um, well, we uh, began the course with discussion of uh, motivations for modeling, for dynamic modeling and a brief survey of, of three major traditions. Um, today we're going, uh, continuing uh, our discussion of the first of those traditions, uh, system dynamics modeling. Uh, with uh, a further uh, furthering of the topics we discussed last time. Um, and in fact, the two previous times uh, where we first introduced uh, stocks and flows as building blocks, the dependence of each on the other, and uh, introduced some higher level molecules as it were in the form of uh, first order delays. And uh, we took a look last time at a little bit associated with the mathematics of first order delays, uh, got a glimpse of how they are numerically simulated and the impact of uh, the, the step size, um, a, a quantity that's uh, often, though not always uh, fixed throughout simulation in terms of model accuracy. Uh, we further talked some about uh, alternative ways of representing first order delays. And, and in fact, we looked at um, one sort of minor variant, which is really a reparameterization, as it were, um, uh, where we could either frame a delay in terms of uh, a, a, a chance per unit time of leaving, uh, denoted in my slides as, as alpha, which is not an unfamiliar um, a denotation of it. And another uh, characterization, uh, mathematically equivalent, where we uh, instead framed it as uh, having a, a mean time in the stock, uh, say mu, um, that's the amount of time people spend in the stock. And we, we examined uh, a situation where the outflow was phrased in terms of that. So instead of the outflow being alpha times the value of the stock. Instead, the outflow was uh, the value of the stock divided by the mean time to transition. Uh, now, uh, to, uh, and, and beyond that, beyond that sort of, sort of uh, literal um, uh, sort of reinterpretation of the system, we further looked at a, uh, a pair of ways of framing first order delays. Uh, on the one hand, uh, from a, a flow centric framework as it were, where we were characterizing the outflow as following the inflow with a certain average delay, hence first order delay, that average delay being mu, if we frame the, the stock, the uh, first order delay in those terms. But we, we saw there was another one where it was sort of a target follower. And this was a stock centric approach for, for framing it. It was uh, where we, uh, we focused on the value of the stock and uh, we took the gap between some target value and the value of the stock. And we adjusted the stock uh, upwards or downwards based on whether the target was above it or below it. And in fact, uh, very quickly, uh, upwards if the target was way above it versus um, only moderately above it where it might shoot up slower and, and vice versa for, for when it was lower. Um, so these are these first order delays. And um, just as I said, uh, when introducing system dynamics, stocks and flows are, are the sort of brick and mortar. They're the, they're the nouns and verbs out of which we build these uh, models at a most elemental level. Uh, these first order delays are quantities that uh, are, are a little bit higher level yet and yet are quite ubiquitous. And today we will be seeing uh, two variants of first order delays. Um, the first of those, which confusingly will be the second that we explore today, 
will be a situation where we add a second outflow to that delay and we kind of reason about some of the mathematics there. But before we do that, we're going to string together first order delays into a series. Um, and uh, these compose into, perhaps not surprisingly, higher order delays, second, third, fourth, et cetera, order delays. And ultimately, we can imagine approaching a, an infinite order delay. Um, so that's, it's, it has, uh, you know, uh, a, a, an unbounded number of, of stages. And we can reason about what its, its behavior will be like, uh, holding constant the amount of time one spends across the entire series as a whole. So uh, we're gonna be examining that today. And, and if time allows, and it will be a packed lecture, we may get to the first elements that will take us beyond this because all the systems that we've been looking at here are in fact linear systems. Um, so much of the motivation of dynamic modeling lies in nonlinear systems, systems where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Um, but we're concentrating on some linear building blocks first. We gave reference to the fact that they were linear last time. The outflow is proportional. The value of the outflow at any one time is proportional to the value of the stock. Uh, it depends linearly on the value of, this, of its corresponding stock. Uh, but systems that are linear, um, uh, Sometimes uh, collectively, um, it requires too much in our heads to think about. And it can be useful to build simulation models for them. But where simulation models really uh, enter their own territory, become absolutely essential, where we can do nothing but simulate them to really understand their implications, is in the context of nonlinearity. In a context where the, um, the system behaves in a fashion that uh, cannot, be, cannot be taken as kind of a superposition of, the, of how it would behave with uh, people starting in each stock in isolation and, and, and solving it for each of those and then summing up the results, but rather where we have an entangling between stocks. Uh, for example, where infection depends not only on the presence of susceptibles out of which the infected people come, but on the presence of infectives to infect them. And it takes two to tango in these nonlinear systems. We need, a, we need susceptibles and we need infectives. And it's really that mixing between the two, the nonlinear character of the mixing that gives infectious diseases and other contagion phenomena like spreading of rumors or conspiracy theories or, or you name it, uh, their unique character. And uh, it's in the sphere of, of nonlinear systems that our intuitions break down horribly and where simulation modeling um, is desperately needed to give us even basic guidance on how to, how to interact with the system. So that's where we're going by the end of the session, if, if time allows, and certainly by next session. That will usher in a level of understanding suitable for addressing uh, the, uh, the balance of that problem set, this, this issue of nonlinearity. But first, we want to we wanna, uh, take on some of the remaining challenges with these linear systems so that we will speed us towards uh, the, the nonlinear component of uh, this, this module of the course. Um, I'm going to, to move quite quickly through this linear component. Um, I don't think the the understanding so conveyed will be um, too challenging, but we are going to start with a mathematical uh, puzzle of sorts or, or something that require you to think a bit mathematically. And for those who have taken uh, probability theory, it will, um, it will require you to, to think back a little bit um, to your probability theory and draw on that knowledge, okay? So, um, with, uh, with that preface, uh, let's switch over to, to, to uh, beautiful mathematics instead of a distinctly unbeauteous uh, face that sits before you now. Okay, so um, here we go. Uh, and I'm going to jump in 
to some of the mathematics associated with first order delays from the perspective of really probing what does this mortality rate mean? So if we have a 0 0.01 there, what does it, what does it mean? I, I gave reference to the fact that it has something to do with probability last time, a probability of transitioning. But if you had listened carefully, you would have heard probability of transitioning per unit time. It's not a probability. It can be greater than one, actually, amongst other things. It's a probability of transitioning per unit time. And take the rest of those words uh, seriously. So we call this, uh, in general, one of the terms that's used is hazard rate, OK? It's also called a probability density. Um, and uh, it refers to the, to the fact that it's not, again, just a, a fraction of probability. It's a per unit, in this case, time quantity, OK? So imagine this probability per unit time of, of alpha. Um, and imagine that we have some small interval of time between zero and t. Maybe t, maybe uh, this uh, mortality rate is 0 0.01 per per year, and our uh, t is you know uh, one hundredth of a year or something like that. Um, imagine a, a small t. Okay, um, the probability of transitioning over that period of time turns out to be alpha t. Alpha is a probability per unit time. T is measured in unit time. So, so if, if our time unit of choice for the model is year, um, uh, you know, 0 0.01, uh, uh, one hundredth of a year would be, uh, would be uh, uh, a t of 0 0.01. And if we multiply alpha times t here, ladies and gentlemen, um, we're multiplying a probability by an amount of time, and that will give us a, a prob uh, sorry, a probability per unit time by an amount of time that will give us a probability. So alpha t is a probability of transitioning over this time between zero and t, okay? In other words, it's of length t, and we have our probability per, per unit length of, of alpha. So if you multiply alpha times t, we get the probability of of transitioning out of, of this stock uh, via this, this flow within this small time t, okay? Now, I could phrase that conversely as, what's the probability of, of not transitioning out over that entire time? Um, I should say entire time t, not one, excuse me. Um, I was frobbing these slides up to the last minute. Um, uh, when some police visited our home and I was uh, taken out of my, my lecture preparation by the need to engage with constables. Um, don't worry, I'm, I'm not in, in handcuffs right now. Um, so uh, ladies and gentlemen, the probability of not transitioning uh, over time uh, T is, is one minus alpha T. It's just a complement of this. If we have we have, you know, a 10% chance of transitioning out in time t. We have a 90% chance of not transitioning out in time t. Those are the only two options. You either transition out or you don't. So there should be complements to one another and they should sum to one. Um, okay, so that should seem easily enough. The key point here is alpha is not a probability. It's in probability per unit time. So we need to multiply it by a time measured in that time unit to to give us a, an honest to goodness probability. And not surprisingly, the probability of staying in stock population over that time is, is just one minus this probability of leaving. It should be pretty comfortable to you. And now the plot, ladies and gentlemen, thickens, okay? Um, so, so now let's consider, consider two sub intervals here. Okay, I'm gonna follow this reasoning in so instead of dealing with just one chance of transitioning over uh, throughout this time, we're going to be considering a case of many, many, many chances. But we'll start one step at a time. This is one chance of transitioning out. You have one shot at transitioning out. Your chance of leaving is alpha t. Your chance of not leaving is 1 minus alpha t. Now let's consider we have two shots here. We, um, we have a first and we have a second. Okay, um, We have two kicks at the can. Each 
involving some duration of time of t over two between zero and t over two on the one hand or t over two and, and t on the other. So we have two kicks at the can here. Now let's consider the chance of leaving any over any one of those uh, those those uh, those times. Let's let's consider the first time without loss of generality. Um, so our chance of leaving, if we have an alpha chance of leaving per unit time, and we have an interval of length t divided by two, our probability of transitioning during that that interval of length t divided by two is alpha t divided by two, and the probability of not transitioning out in that first first half is one minus t over two. Okay, um, and it turns out that similar reasoning is going to hold for the second half. So look, the only way we can not transition out, let's consider this whole interval, zero at t. The only way that we don't transition out of this during this entire interval is if we don't transition out in the first half and, and ladies and gentlemen, we don't transition out in the second half. Right, we, we need to survive the first half and we need to survive the second half without transitioning out. Um, that's the only way we're gonna do it. So we need to dodge the bullet for the first half, dodge the bullet for the second half, right? Um, now, if, if we consider the first half, we already said the probability of not transitioning out is one minus T divided by two. Um, and uh, it turns out this probability will hold that's the probability if you haven't left by this midpoint, that's the probability between t over two and t that you won't leave as well. So the probability that we will remain in the state that we won't transition out in either one, either of these intervals is that quantity from right here squared. We have to not do it in the first and then we have to not do it in the second. And those, those probabilities end up multiplying, okay? Um, so, so the second one, uh, for the second interval, it's, it's uh, in light of the fact we haven't left yet, um, we, we and, and what's the probability of leaving in that second half, given that we're halfway through, we haven't yet, let, yet left, it's one minus, Alpha over uh, alpha t over two. So the probability of remaining in the state at the end of this entire interval turns out to be one minus alpha t over two quantity squared. Okay, that's that's just shown here. Should be pretty clear. You you got to dodge the bullet the first time, and given that you dodged it, the chance of you dodging the bullet the second time is the same thing. Uh, you're still there, and the question is. Are you going to survive this next this next time of equal length uh, alpha t over two? So the probability of remaining in the state at the end of these two kicks of the can is one minus alpha t over two quantity squared, and the probability of transitioning over the entire time of of actually leaving is is one minus that. Okay, um, we're going to continue this now. Imagine for three times, and I think you're getting a, a, a glimpse of where this is going, right? Um, instead of being one minus alpha t over two squared, instead of it having to dodge the bullet the first time, and then since you dodged, if you dodged it successfully the first time, you dodged it the second time, um, and that's it. No, now we've got a third time. So you've got to dodge it three times. So instead of being one minus alpha t over two, squared, it's one minus alpha t over two, anyone? Uh, squared. Cube. Cubed, cubed, cubed. It's a cube. Yeah, there we go. Um, uh, so, and in some way you're probably if not transitioning out because each of these times you have a chance of, of, remaining in that in that state of one minus alpha t over th over three and you have to you have to uh remain in it each of those times where each successive time it's you know conditional on the previous one so so this cube comes out 
Um, we have to dodge the bullet three times. Each time we're dodging it with independent probability one minus alpha t over three. Okay, now if we go to n of these, imagine dividing up the same interval t, same length, uh, into n times um, n little intervals. Now we have one minus alpha t over n all to the nth power. Mm -hmm. um, is our chance of remaining in this state. We, we dodge it the first time, the second time, the third time, fourth time. We got to keep on dodging it each and every time uh, in order to avoid transitioning out. And you know that's asking a lot, right? Even if your chance of, uh, of dodging it is uh, 90%, they start to compound, right? Uh, you, you, uh, you have a 90% chance to survive the first one. By the next one, so it, you have one, one minus 0.1 chance of, of, of leaving, that's 90% chance. By the second time, the chance of leaving is, is, is 0.81. And then, then it, it compounds further, right? You're gonna have this 0.81 times nine and 72.9% and, and, it, and it keeps on going down. So, it turns out that as, as n, as you consider smaller and smaller intervals, smaller and finer and finer time periods, and you consider your, what's your chance of surviving all of them as you're getting finer and finer. Well, you know, each little sub interval, you have a smaller chance of leaving in because after all, it's getting to be a very small bit of time. Uh, but at the same time, you have many of them that you have to survive. And it turns out that this approach is this function which some of you will recognize um, as a friend. Um, I hope no one recognizes it as, as an enemy because it's one of the most uh, uh, sublimely beautiful constructs invented by the, the human mind, but, um, or discovered by the human mind, but um, I digress. So it's, uh, as n goes to infinity, um, your chance of, of surviving um, so that you remain in the state is e to the minus alpha t, okay? Um, and it turns out that this is actually very, very close to alpha if t is really, really small, but, um, or, or you could think alpha t is, is very small, but um, it, it gives us a, sort of a continuous way of, of measuring this. And it leads to a curve which declines exponentially in a way that you will have seen. And I have a picture of it here. It, 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 it does look like this. Now this is showing something a bit different, but the curve is the same. This is that curve, e to the minus alpha t, okay? Um, and you could think of here, although the, the meaning is a bit, um, th this example is taken from something we'll get to in a moment. But initially, after time zero, you're definitely in the stock still. You're definitely not leaving. Uh, but with each successively longer time, your chance of remaining in the stock drops, okay? Uh, and the further and further out you go, the, the further it drops down. This is e to the minus alpha t, okay? It declines. Uh, in this exponential way, and that's why we see these um, we see these types of uh, curves coming out of the number of people in the stock. It's because each of those people has this sort of probability of of remaining there, and so if we start one person in that stock, it, the probability there's still a person in that stock goes down from one. And it starts approaching zero eventually, but it declines in this sort of uh, exponential fashion. Okay, um, so so that's a little bit of the mathematics of this. The big point I want to have in mind here is it'll be a mistake to think of this mortality rate as a probability. It's a probability per unit time. Okay, and uh, do remember that it's in an inverse relationship between with the mean length of time in the stock. So a mortality rate of 0.1, 
would mean a mean length of time, uh, so 0.1 days, 0.1 per day, I should say, would mean how many days do you spend on the stock on average? If it's 0.1 per day, how many days do you spend in the stock on average? 10 days. 10 days. If mortality rate is 0.5, how many days do you spend in the stock on average? Two days. Two. Good. Okay, now I'm gonna say, if the mortality rate is, point, is, is one, how many days on average do you spend in the stock? One. One. If the mortality rate is two per day, how long do you spend on the stock on average? Half a day. Half a day. It's, it's all dictated by this continuous translation. It just means you leave quicker. It means, you, you know, you bug out of there really quickly. Um, so the average length of time is 0.5 days. That mortality rate could be 10 per day. And remember, it's not a probability. It's a probability per day. Um, if, if we expressed it in years, it might be, you know, one over 36, uh, you know, roughly 0. 0.0028 or something like that. But, uh, but if we're expressing it as per day probability, it's, it's, it's 10. And that would mean you spend an average amount of time of, of, of 10 days in the stock before leaving. Uh, it all carries, carries through and there's nothing inconsistent about it. Uh, after all, nature doesn't care about our units. Um, if we talked about things in years or days, it, it would be the same. And you know, if you want to convert the mortality rate from a per day probability to a per year probability, you just end up, you know, multiple. Excuse me. So I, I misspoke earlier. If 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 this was a point point oh one per day. Oh, sorry. If it were one or ten per day. Then it per year basis will be like three, you know, 10 times 365 per year, right? But on a microsecond basis, it'll be mighty small yet. Uh, it would still be very small. So, you know, um, it depends on our choice of time, right? Uh, it's a probability per unit time. And depending what our unit time is, it might be above or below one. That's not the point. The point is that your mean length of time is. It measured in whatever time units you're using, your mean length of time in the stock is one over this, uh, uh, this, this value per, per uh, length of time. Okay, um, so that's a little bit about understanding hazard rates. The point is, it's a continuous thing. You're not just having one kick of the can over that entire interval T. You're not having two kicks of the can. You're not even having 10. You're having a conceptually infinite number and we're considering what's your chance of leaving in any little bit of time, okay? I wanna talk now though about uh, higher, order, higher order delays, okay? I talked about how these first order delays serve as building blocks for larger constructs. Um, and one of the things that motivates this is the fact that when we have a first order delay, um, it's memoryless and, and mark my words here, Know this concept. Um, your chance per unit time of leaving this stock is, is independent. If you're still there, your chance of leaving in the next little bit of time, T is alpha T, okay? Regardless of how long you've been there, your chance of leaving is, is, is independent of, of how long you've been there. It's memoryless is, is what we call it. It doesn't matter when you came in, how long you've been there, you have that same chance, alpha t, of, of leaving in the next little bit time t, okay? Um, now, often within systems we model, we actually want to move beyond this memoryless assumption. We want, want a system which, which is not memoryless, where, where it actually, for example, your chance of developing um, serious COVID, uh, having caught COVID, will change a lot over the course of the amount of time since you were infected with COVID. During the first, first you know, day or two, your chance of developing serious COVID is extremely small. Uh, and even during the next handful of days, um, 
it's it's very small. You're going to develop shortness of breath, high fever. It's about six days after emergence of symptoms or so that you start really having that chance. So there's this staging of things. It, you know, it's not we just have some probability once we're infected of, of getting serious COVID on a per day basis, uh, going on to serious COVID. It's not like that at all. We have to keep track of the stages of it. There's a stage where you're not even infectious. This is a stage that's pre-symptomatic. And then if you go on to symptoms, this is a stage that's symptomatic with mild symptoms before you have much chance of going on to, to serious or critical symptoms. So we want to move beyond a a sort of memoryless assumption is captured by something like this. And the way we often do it is we string things together, okay? Um, uh, and not surprisingly, first order delays form the building blocks for higher order delays, okay? We, we hitch them up in sequence. And the sequence as a whole does not exhibit this memoryless property. Um, and in fact, it, it it, it has a rather different um, behavior in terms of considering its outflow compared to the relationship of outflow to inflow than does just a, a bog simple first order delay, okay? So we deal with these kth order delays. So here's our first simple first order delay. And uh, we have behavior like this coming out of it, right? I wanna highlight one point of intuition where students uh, get confused here. Um, look. Uh, as I said, no matter how long you remain here, your chance of leaving per unit time uh, in the next little bit is the same. Fair enough, right? Uh, if you're still here, your chance of dying uh, from, in this case, from this virulent infection is, is the same if you're in this stock. Uh, but you're, from an unconditional standpoint, uh, you're a lot more likely to have left during, if you were in that stock initially, you were a lot more likely to have left in the first month than you will be to have left in the, in the you know, 10th month. Uh, why? Well, you would have had to have you know, avoided leaving, dodged all those bullets for all those previous months to have survived for the 10th month. So, the chance that you're still there to, to leave in the 10th month is, is quite low. And so your chance of leaving in the 10th month is a lot lower than it was from leaving in the first month. But if you are still there in the stock at the 10th, beginning of the 10th month, your chance of leaving the next month is, is the same as it was during the first month. So we have to distinguish between these facts in our minds. No matter how long you've been in the stock, if you are still there, your chance of leaving is the same. But a lot more people do leave in the first month because there are more people to leave in the first month than in a later month. So if you look at, at this, you'll, you'll see this uh, sort of behavior. Um, and uh, you know it declines much more steeply at first because you're much more likely to be in there, but it continues on. And if you had you know, one being a million people, a lot more are leaving in the first month uh, on a per month basis, more leaving than in, in later months because there's not as many people left there. I want to highlight the fact though, though, that, sorry, that the outflow is proportional to the inflow. And so the outflow here is just proportional to this. So if we think about the outflow from the entire system, it goes uh, like this, okay? Now let's consider stringing these together. This is a second order delay, okay? Um, and here we're going to have some inflow, some, uh, and we're going to have two stages, one for the kind of first half and one for the second half. And then we're going to have an outflow from the entire system, outflow. And we're going to compare systematically that outflow with what we see from the first order delay, from this sort of system, okay, um, for for, for this case uh, where we are initially starting within the system, where we start, start in the system. So if we have a second order delay, two stages, and we start in it 
initially in stage one. That's that's all filled up. Stage two is zero. This is this is what we get out. The outflow looks like this. Okay. Um, it 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 goes up and then comes down. How does that differ from the outflow from a first order delay? So if we start in the system all at the beginning, all at stage one, and we want to compare what the outflow does here compared to what it does in this sort of system where we start all at the beginning in the stock and then we leave, how do those two differ? Anyone? This outflow from the outflow we just saw, how does it differ? There's no one outflowing at the very end of the second order delay. So the total number of people in, yeah, in the system grows until they're, they start to leave from that second order delay. Yeah, that's right. That's right. There's no one initially in here. They're all at the beginning. They're all progressing through from the very start. So no one's in the stage two at first. So, so even though the system as a whole is, is full, it, it has people in it. I mean, when I say system as a whole, I mean, there's, plenty of people in it, they're all in stage one. So there's no one coming out initially. It takes some time for people to flow into stage two and then they start flowing out. And so we have this, this behavior of the whole system which starts low rather than starting high. Um, and then they start flowing out. Now your total likelihood of still being in the system declines like this. This also is a little bit different from before. Anyone spot the difference from a first order delay? It's got two reflex points with bends in it. Yes. Uh, so you end up seeing uh, there's this kind of uh, inflection point here where it turns from concave downwards to concave upwards. And you, you notice this initial initial curvature that's quite different from here right um where really there's no concave downward component there's no component where it's been more flat and then starts coming down and then has to bend over so this is this is the probability of still being in the system with a first order delay after a certain amount of time just declines exponentially here look after a very small amount of time you're just about as likely to still be in the system um uh, during the first very little bit as you were at the start, because it takes time for it to, to, to get to the point where people actually start leaving. So you're very likely to be in it for some time. And then it starts declining more, more, more quickly. And then it starts to look a little bit more like a first order delay because people are more, more concentrated in the second, or, second stage. Okay, let's consider a third order delay here. Okay. Here's the third order delay. So we have something that also starts low, but you'll notice that compared to a second order delay, this one actually starts low and it takes some time to gather momentum. The second order delay just started shooting up there. Third order delay, well, it stays low for some time and then it shoots up and, and comes down. And you see this initial kind of, um, slow decline, even in a more pronounced way of, in a third order delay for the likelihood of still being in the system. So it turns out that the further out you go, if we were to consider a sixth order delay, a 10th order delay, what have you, you get something like this. The further out you go, it, it starts to look more bell-shaped. Um, and in all of these, it turns out, have the same mean, okay? Um, it's just, uh, the ones that are higher order delays tend to be more concentrated around a certain delay um, till the outflow reaches its peak. Um, it's, it's concentrated around a, a certain delay as it were from that start when everyone was, was started uh, right in the system. Um, and all of these I think have, uh, have that mean delay if memory serves me as being time 20. But the, uh, the ones, for example, like a first order delay, which is the kind of one that doesn't look like the others, it's the brown one here. Um, it has a lot of possibility you won't leave till, you know, that, that uh, the outflow is, is larger till later. But as we go up in orders of delay, it, it, it's more and more concentrated around 20, becomes more and more narrow. 
And for those who have the requisite mathematical background to recognize this fact, this approach is an impulse function. Uh, it's going to grow narrower um, uh, as well. And you can see it's kind of narrowing around this, um, around this certain point. OK, so um, we could think of this you know, as k goes to infinity, not just 6th, but 10th, but 20th, by 100th, 1,000th uh, order delay. And it, it turns out it approaches a normal distribution that becomes very, very narrow, it more and more thin and narrow, and gives the exact amount of delay from the start uh, that you'd expect with, for, uh, for, for the delay associated with the system as a whole. All of this is keeping constant the amount of time across the all the stages, the mean time across all stages. And it just divides those up among the stages for these higher levels of delays. Um, OK, so higher order delays are basically strings of lower order delays uh, strung together, ladies and gentlemen, in a fashion that um, better captures the, the fact that the outflow is, is really you know, kind of a, 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 a good approximation to a delay of the input. With a first order delay, we're, we're kind of stretching it a lot. That's the brown one. With these higher order delays, we're getting more and more similar to what we might expect from a, a real delay of, a, of an impulse function coming in, which is what this really simulates. You know, everyone came in at time zero, essentially. Um, and you see the, the brown is kind of a poor, poor man's, uh, poor person's interpretation of that. Um, and these, uh, this family, by the way, is called the Erlang family. It's an Erlang family of distributions, and it comes out in probability theory as well. Um, and um, the exponential is just one. It's kind of a particularly degenerate member of the Erlang family. Um, OK. Um, generally speaking, though, these, these delays come out of, of a need. Um, a need to represent processes in the world that have stages. You know, if we buy a car, we don't expect its probability of failing per year, per month to be independent of how long we've had it. Um, maybe the first couple of months, uh, uh, you know, if it's a, a used car, um, we might expect there's some risk. But after we've had it, you know, a year or two, the probability that it's going to die in a per month basis is hopefully pretty small. But if we've had it, you know, 25 years, 30 years, 40 years, um, that that probability of dying per month that we successfully use it might have might have gone up since when it was five years out from our purchase. Um, and this is true for for diseases people go through. It's true for stages of university where you know you hopefully your probability of graduation uh, on a per year basis changes over the course of your time in the system and hopefully it rises monotonically. Um, uh, but uh, we don't expect it to be the same no matter how long you've been in, in as an undergrad. We expect it to be quite high after four years and for some three or for some doing dual degrees, five, et cetera. Um, uh, so, so we often will represent these systems with cascades of first order delays, which represent stages. This is from a, one of our, our early models at the U of S involving uh, chronic renal failure for diabetes patients with successive stages of, of renal disease, for example. Uh, uh, and you have these things strung together and uh, you have this annual likelihood of development of stage three disease or stage uh, two or three or four or five in a way that's completely familiar to you for, from first order delays. This is, they are like the, the, uh, the basic building blocks of a lot of practical models are these first order delays and you'll see them everywhere. Um, phrased as either chance per unit time of, of leaving, like this likelihood per unit time of leaving or in terms of mean time. But there's something else that's here as well and it's something else we're gonna to get to, which is this issue of competing risks. Often with a given, with a given uh, stock, 
uh, we have more than one outflow. And all the rules we've learned about, you know, the stock will go up if the sum of the outflows is greater than some of, or some of the inflows is greater than the sum of the outflows. It'll go down if the sum of the outflows is greater than the sum of the inflows. Those all hold true. And I tried to articulate them in a fashion that gave a nod to the fact that we often do have multiple inflows and outflows. But um, in talking about first order delays, we've been reasoning about a single outflow. And, you know, I thought we would uh, do well to spend five or 10 minutes talking about what's the situation where we have two outflows. Okay, so suppose we have diabetes patients here. We have some progressing on to end stage renal disease, um, maybe a kidney transplant or dialysis. Uh, others who, who um, may pass away before that point, okay? Now, each of these is, is represented in a way that will be familiar for a first order delay. The formula here is uh, given that this is a mean time, it's gonna be the diabetic population divided by the mean time. For this one down here, uh, it's phrased in an annual risk of diabetic mortality. So this formula is gonna be diabetic population times this annual probability per year of dying, okay? Um, so these formulae are both very much what we like, but how do we, um, how do we accommodate them in our flows? Well, it turns out we see something very similar uh, in the sense that we have a population that's that's coming down here uh, over time in an exponential fashion. And um, there's um, there's no uh, there's no mystery to this. Basically, we have a differential equation like this. Your the rate of change of x, how quickly it's going up or down. Um, this is how the stock is changing is given by the sum of the inflows minus the sum of the outflows. In this case, there's, there's no inflows. There's one out, there's two outflows, excuse me. So we have these two outflows associated with a minus sign. It's minus the sum of the outflows, remember. Um, so we have minus alpha X, where alpha is probability developing end stage renal disease. And we have beta where that's the probability of dying from other causes. And of course, just rearranging, we could represent it like this. And, you know, this is going to yield behavior that's, and you may remember this from basic calculus, there's, it's easily integrated. And you get e to the minus alpha plus beta times t, which kind of stands to reason. I mean, if, if there's no one, there's no chance of dying from, from other causes, beta is zero. This is just a first order delay and it's e to the minus alpha t. Yep, the number of people in the stock goes down is e to the minus alpha t. We saw that earlier. But if alpha is, no, uh, is non-zero and beta is non-zero, uh, we might leave with this other, other uh, flow. And it turns out that the fraction that go down the flow with go down the straight path as opposed to this path is just based on the on the 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 ratio of this mean time to the excuse me uh, it would be actually this phrased as a probability per unit time of leaving um, divided by the sum of of that one and 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 this this one down here okay so it's just going to be alpha divided by alpha over beta um, so, so that's the fraction that go down the, the path with, with the, uh, the alpha hazard. And it turns out that um, the, the, the mean time to leave via the, the path going straight uh, is given by this relationship. And, and it, it kind of stands to reason um, that, that look, if, if uh, you have a very, very strong outflow going down here, uh, it's gonna be quickly draining the diabetic population. The people who leave onto end-stage renal disease have got to get out of there really quick to, to, to be in any number. And so disproportionately, those would be the people who left quicker, okay? Um, and, uh, and so it tends to skew of those who develop end stage renal disease, they'll, they'll tend to do it sooner if there's a high competing risk. Um, 
the, the, the people we look at will have left quickly because otherwise they, there's a good chance they would have died from other causes. By contrast, if there's very little chance of mortality in this stock, people have, you know, may take many, many, many years to develop end-stage renal disease, and it will tend to make that average amount of time to developing it longer. And that's what you see uh, in this formula here. It's alpha over alpha plus beta quantity squared, okay? So if beta is zero, what does this turn into? If beta is zero, if we have nobody leaving with, with this flow, what does this turn into? Anyone? Mathematically? If beta is zero, what does this rent turn into? Uh, square root of alpha. Uh, close. Uh, Isn't just one over a? It's one over alpha. Yeah, it's one over alpha. Yeah, um, a alpha. So uh, good, good call. I, I welcome both those contributions. Um, uh, but and you may have think, but thinking because the square is in the in the in the uh, denominator that you know you want to somehow take its inverse. But the point is that. Alpha in the numerator, alpha, since beta is zero, it's just alpha squared in the denominator. So it just becomes one over alpha, okay? Um, which is, anyone recognize one over alpha? That's the... Mean time? Mean lifetime? Yeah, it's the mean time you spend in that stock. Excellent, excellent. I'm glad I didn't have a pop quiz today. I'm glad you are, I bet you are too. Um, so it's one over alpha is the average time they spend in the stock. And that's, that's what this formula is giving us. It's giving the mean time leave until you leave via flow one. That's flow one is this, this flow here. If this one is zero, the mean time till you leave is one over alpha. Mm. Um, if you have a chance per unit time of leaving of alpha. Um, by contrast, if beta is really, really, big, really, really big, you know, much, much bigger than alpha. Um, it's going to pull this denominator really, you know, really down, right? Um, it's going to have something really big in the denominator, which is going to mean your average amount of time in the, in that stock before you leave is going to get really small. Um, you, again, the people, the only people are going to be leaving out to that stock or those that got out early because the other ones will have been sucked out that other, that other flow. Um, uh, if beta uh, equals alpha here, uh, if you had beta equals alpha, you'd have alpha over two alpha squared or alpha over four alpha squared. Uh, and, uh, and, and then the alpha in the numerator and the denominator will, will cancel. So be one over uh, four, four alpha. Um, and, uh, and that you know, gives a, um, uh, a lower value of, of the mean time to leave than if you had, uh, if you had uh, just alpha by itself. In other words, it skews it, 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 the people to, to leave earlier. Okay, so that, that was just a comment uh, there on competing risks. So the, the long and short I want you to, to cut, take away from this, okay, with competing risks is look, um, uh, our analysis of time for first order delays should, should be deeply ingrained in you. So the mean, so the, if you have a probability per unit time of leaving a stock of alpha, the mean time in the stock is one over alpha. Uh, if, if that's the only outflow. If it's not the only outflow, the other outflows do influence the average amount of time you spend in the stock as a whole. That was this whole thing about um, the average amount of time that you spend in the stock as a, as a whole now is, actually I should have stated that very clearly here and I, I don't actually think it does. How, uh, if this is alpha chance per unit time of leaving and beta chance per unit time of leaving this other one, um, what's your average amount of time in the stock overall? Like, like uh, what's, what's the uh, average amount of time people spend in the stock overall? 
it's one over alpha plus beta quantity. So one over quantity alpha plus beta. Um, uh, so, so, so that is something you should know. Like multiple flows will mean your average time in the stock is lower. Mm. But the fact that you have another flow competing with this one will mean that the average amount of time until you leave via this flow will be lower too, because there's this competing one going for it that that will may censor people who would have left later because they will have left via this other flow already. So. So just be aware when you have an extra outflow, it does skew the statistics that are cherished statistics. Well, at least they're cherished amongst certain of us. Um, so, so ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, you know, you should know this reciprocal relationship between mean time, probability per unit time of leaving with a single outflow. And with multiple outflows, you should know uh, that those outflows lower the mean time. And if there's an outflow alpha and beta, then if the mean time in the stock becomes no longer just one over alpha, it's one over alpha plus beta. Um, if there was a third flow gamma associated with the rate gamma, it'll be one over alpha plus beta plus gamma. Um, after all, they're they're all leaving the stock as a, you know, with 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 number of people leaving there proportional to the number you can do if you don't care where they go you could just combining them into one flow out with the sum of that rate right and probability per 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 unit time of leaving will be alpha plus beta plus gamma and and you get that mean time in there so it's, it's got to be that um your average amount of time in there and you should know that competing flows do change do skew the statistics for this this main flow um, so that's what I expect you to, uh, to take away. Now I want to talk a little bit about this and I, I may have a take home exercise about this. I, I don't want to take the, the time to, to do it right now, but, um, uh, this is kind of a little bit of a, of an interesting, uh, exercise. Um, it's interesting to see. But it's also um, not only engaging, but conceptually, it it highlights a very important uh, characteristic associated with uh, with with feedback systems, which are based on balancing loops. Okay, um, so here, ladies and gentlemen, we see two first order delays. These might not seem immediately familiar. Um, um, you don't see the inflows and outflows, but these are the type of first order delay that I noted the, the kind of the, the reframing of first order delays as a target follower that I noted in the final slide, final slide duh, I believe of my last lecture. The, that final slide, I said there was a target and this is kind of the stock centric way of framing a first order delay. And um, the flow into the stock is given by the target minus the, the value of the stock divided by some delay. Now here you see a variant of it. I'll, I'll go back to that original one and I stand remiss for not, not including that, that slide here, okay? Um, but it's, uh, this is the slide of which I speak um, this one right right here, okay? This is from last time. So here we had a target follower framing of first order delays. We had some stock, we had a target, we had the gap between the, the target and that stock divided by a delay. And I argued from this very seat that that was equivalent to this formulation and I, I, I argued about where the various terms in this formula came from, okay? Um, so, so this is from last time, and I will see if I can, after the fact, remediate this very lecture um, uh, here. Uh, oh man, you, you mumble. Um, uh, the answer may be 
no it's beyond remediation but uh give me a second okay it looks like looks like the powerpoint god's a smile on us today okay this is great um so um or at least it's less bad so so this is our first order delay reformulation last time now this is a close variant of it but i i want you to to track this a little bit okay um this is a close cousin of that, but you, you've got to recognize a few key changes. Okay, so there is a stock P um, and a flow into that. And that flow is given by target following. But you'll notice that, that here, the gap is not between the target and this stock, but the target and this perception. This is capturing the fact that, ladies and gentlemen, when it comes to interacting with the world, and this is true for people, but it's also true for other systems, uh, animals to be sure, but, but also um, uh, systems for decision-making, IT systems, et cetera, that might involve some, some, uh, some controlling functions to, to undertake action. Often we think, we like to flatter ourselves by thinking we observe the world as it is. But often we uh, observe the world um, as we perceive it to be in a way that abstracts a lot of details and sometimes imposes our cherished understanding on the world, cherished assumptions on the world. Um, and our perception may be somewhat off, but very commonly our perception is delayed. And this is one of the the uh, you know the profound things that comes out of neurological experiments, for example, that people have delayed perceptions of things. So when you're steering that car on ice and you oversteer, you know you're reacting to your perception perhaps half a second ago and uh, swerving around uh, rather than reacting just at this instant. What's the current situation? So what we've captured here is the fact that, look, um, uh, that the current situation in the world is not what you have, have, have recourse to. It's not what you have access to. Um, the current situation in the world is characterized, the state of the world is characterized as P. Think about it as a you know, position on, of a steering wheel to, to turn or position of a car or what have you. Um, this is, a, this is a, you know, a, a current state of the world. And then we have a perception of it that tracks that with a certain perception delay. So we're perceiving what the situation in the world is um, in a way that will follow it. And you know, if, if it stops changing, perceived P will catch up to it. But there's a delay and if P is changing, the state of the world is changing, our perception of it will only catch up over time. It'll, it'll be ever delayed. So that's our perception of the world. It's this kind of delayed version of P. And in fact, it's a first order delayed version of P. This is a first order delay involving, um, involving this perceived P versus this target. Okay, so this is a target follower down here. Now this perceived P um, is in turn used for this top one to try to adjust the state of the world. So here we're undertaking an action in the world, like putting on our brakes or turning the wheel further or what have you based on our perception. Um, and we're, we see the target and we're trying to match it with our perception of the situation. And Charles Sanders Pierce had a whole uh, theory uh, involving uh, this this fact that you know our under actions are undertaken based on perceptions of the world, not based on the world, and it leads to a whole set of consequences. Um, and there's an area called perceptual control theory that that reflects this. But the fact that we have this target against the perception version ends up having profound impact for on the consequences. And specifically, what you see come out of this is not a situation where P nicely approaches um, uh, some the target. Instead, you see it oscillating around B 
because it overshoots and it undershoots, it takes it too far in one direction and realizes it has to compensate the other direction. And it adjusts, but in this kind of oscillatory fashion that eventually damps down if target stops moving to the correct value. But if target's moving around, you're gonna be ever moving that car swerving around in, in, um, in attempts to, to catch it, okay? Because you're dealing with a, a delayed perception of the situation. You're, you're chasing the tail um, and never quite getting ahead of the situation. You're not skating ahead of the puck on this one. So this is an interesting little uh, exercise I may uh, ask you to undertake. I might also fold it into a coming, coming assignment. Uh, but it shows how, despite having two balancing loops here, these are two, two um, loops that are balancing in character. We end up having a situation which exhibits uh, this, this oscillatory behavior. It doesn't just nicely gain stability. It overcompensates, it undercompensates, and it shoots around in ways that, um, that don't lead to uh, stability in the short term, okay? Um, so just be aware of this, um, uh, that delays, that, uh, and, and mark my words, this is the slogan. I'm going to teach you the slogan for this, because the slogan may be asked for on the final exam. Balancing loops with a delay generally lead to oscillations, often while approaching that, that stability. So it leads towards stability with oscillation. If you don't see much delay, it'll tend to, to move towards stability without a lot of oscillations. It's in the presence of delays that you see this oscillatory behavior. And, uh, and ladies and gentlemen, uh, delays are legion. They, they surround us. And one of the biggest places we get delays in systems is with stocks. And not surprisingly here, we have a stock for perceived P because we need to represent the inertia in the system. There's this older perception that's gotta be you know, overwhelmed eventually by, this, um, by the new character of P for it to, to be brought into alignment. And stocks are everywhere around us that need to be drained, need to be built up, need to be altered, whether it's a stock of beliefs or you know, a stock of trust that needs to be built for people to listen or a stock of education that needs to be grown um, or a stock of associated with perception. It takes time to change the state of systems. And a lot of that is due to stocks in the associated delays and building them up with flows. And what this shows is that oscillations are what's expected. You know, we, we kind of careen around what we, we are seeking to, to state we're seeking to get to groping to try to find that, that, that state that uh, is, is, is uh, where we're gonna be uh, in the, at best accord, okay? So that's a general lesson about the, the world. Okay, um, so uh, I'd like now, as I was hoping to, to uh, transition us, whoa, uh, to some, some bigger uh, quarries, okay? Um, and I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna uh, supplement these slides for, for next time. These are somewhat under construction, but, We've been dealing, ladies and gentlemen, to this point with linear systems. I said this in the opening minutes and I'll emphasize it here. Dealing with systems where, for example, the flows, I think first order delay are proportional to the value of the stock. Um, that was true with competing risks. It was true with stringing first order delays together into higher order delays. These are all linear systems and uh, it's the characteristic of linear systems that I actually don't probably need uh, these, uh, 
these slides here. Are you looking at my slides or are you looking at my, uh, my mug? Currently we can see you. Okay, okay. well, my condolences. Um, so, uh, you know, we'll, we'll uh, bear with, uh, with that, um, that injury right now. Um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, when we're dealing with linear systems, um, we're dealing fundamentally with systems where we can take them apart into their pieces, understand those pieces, and, and by understanding how it responds to each of those pieces, um, sum up that understanding, superimpose that understanding to understand how it would be a for the whole system. Okay. Um, so if we do go back to uh, any of those, those stock and flow models we saw earlier, um, because we were dealing with, with a linear system, for example, we could have started them if, if we had a system with many stocks and it's linear, um, we could start, we could get the value of how it will behave with respect to those stocks altogether by, by summing up how the system would behave considering uh, initial people only in one stock at a time. So one stock starts full of the people there and the others are empty. And then next time that stock is zero, but another stock starts full and we simulate the behavior from that. And the next one, we, each of those is starts empty and we go to another one which starts full. And we do this for all the different stocks. We see what its behavior is and we sum up all those behaviors to get the behavior as it would be if you started the system with people in each and every one of those stocks. It's the nature of linear systems to give that. And in fact, um, uh, if we're to, uh, go to go to the slides here, um, this, this is true for uh, these sort of dynamical systems. It's true for, for non-dynamical systems. If, if we have a function, and in this case, it's a function involving the evolution of the system, how it's gonna change in the next little bit of time. Um, uh, but in other cases, it may be a formula. Um, we call it linear if f of a plus b is just equal to f of a plus f of b. Um, so for example, um, uh, if we have a function that you know, doubles its argument, right? Um, if we have uh, this function applied to a plus b, we'll get two times a plus two times b. And that's the same as two times a plus b together. Um, Another way to define is if we scale the situation. So if we start it with only, for example, one person infective initially, or we start with a hundred people infective, the result should be, you know, the result, sorry, with a hundred people infective, it should be a hundred times as big as the result for, for one person infective. And, um, you know, this starts to, really break down when you consider the effects of certain policies, the effects of certain investments, um, where there's, there's impacts of scale. You've got to invest enough for it to make a difference. Uh, and if you go way beyond that, it saturates. These terms come up in the context of nonlinear systems. Um, and you know when we're dealing with things like the spread of COVID, we have to centrally uh, consider Nonlinearity. I mean, after all, if we started with just susceptibles, we consider just susceptibles. We said, look, I'm going to simplify my life and I'm going to consider how COVID spreads where we only have susceptibles, no infectives. How does it spread? Well, you know, we really won't get very far. I mean, everyone will stay susceptible. And suppose we were saying, well, okay, um, we'll, we'll start with no susceptibles, we'll only infectives, and we'll consider that. Um, where's it going to go? Well, okay, we have some infected, but there's no one they can infect. And so, you know, they'll die down over time as they recover. Or, you know, some will, will, will be hospitalized and some tragically might pass away, but it's not going to give us a sense of the spread of COVID. In order to simulate effects like the spread of uh, infectious disease, or the spread of rumors or contagion from, from uh, disinformation or from uh, you know, uh, changing uh, opinions, changing uh, beliefs about vaccination, uh, conspiracy theories. 
we have to deal with the fact that um, it's essential to consider simultaneously uh, both those who, who uh, have the situation now, like they're infective, and those who, who could get it, those who believe, you know, a crazy conspiracy theory, and those who are, uh, who, who are uh, not currently believers and are naive to it and might, might be influenced by it, etc., those who haven't heard a rumor and those who have. Um, we need to consider those both. We can't parcel it out into to each of those pieces. So in nonlinear systems, uh, instead of having, for example, transitions where we have the outflow is equal to some constant times the inflow, we're going to have something, sorry, uh, instead of being outflow is equal to some constant times the stock, we're going to have uh, a situation where the outflow is equal to not just a constant times that stock, but a constant times that stock times another stock, um, a different one. So we need both. We need people in both. We need susceptibles and we need infectives. And what we're going to see, in fact, is exactly it. And perhaps the most defining immediate characteristic will be instead of having, as in first order delays, you know, constants times the, uh, the value of a stock for the flows, we're going to have things like beta times S, which S is susceptibles times I, which is infectives. Or in a more articulated way, uh, beta times C times uh, I over some maximum population, that would be the fraction of the population that's infective, uh, times, uh, times some uh, S. Um, to be the number of people who get infected per unit time. So here we're having S and I considered simultaneously because if there are zero susceptibles, there's going to be zero infections. Or alternatively, if there may be lots of susceptibles, but zero infectives, there's going to be zero infectives. We need both. And that small change, which may seem so textual, so lexical, you know, throwing in both these state variables to this formula, will actually be foundational in its impact. And it means that we can't simulate it with respect to each in isolation and expect the, the result to be the sum of them. It's this entangling, ladies and gentlemen, in the most painful fashion that, that leads these systems to be so difficult to disentangle, to, to cut through, to reason about. And uh, we're going to be jumping into this phenomenon of nonlinearity, and we'll see it as huge ramifications. Amongst other things, it means that we can't solve the system in closed form. We can't write down a neat formula that tells us how it's going to behave, like we could actually with linear systems. Those who have engineering training may know how to do that, or those who are trained in differential equations far enough for a linear system. It's quite beautiful. For a nonlinear system, we don't have that option. But more than this, we can have multiple basins of attraction. The system can get in modes of behavior that that are quite different and where it can get trapped in certain modes that require a lot of investment to get it back to the opposite mode. It can, it can get stuck in kind of vortices as it were, where um, you know, it's stuck in a situation of endemic COVID infection instead of COVID basically dying out, for example. Um, and uh, systems like this can also exam uh, exhibit chaotic behavior, the behavior where small differences in initial conditions or in a parameter can lead to marked changes um, that are very hard to predict, almost look random, but are in fact just uh, uh, an artifact of the, uh, the, the high dependence on, on uh, small, small changes in value caused by reinforcing loops. Uh, there can be many steady states for the system. Long term, it can set, settle down into any number of different states. So when we're dealing with nonlinear systems, our intuitions are most sorely pressed. We, we, we find it hard to, to reason about them with clarity. And often we make gross mistakes. Um, and yet, if we understand how to judiciously interact with them, we can secure great economies. So for example, um, we can 
know, okay, if we can just invest enough in this program, uh, enough in this investment in childhood in, uh, education to empower children born to poor households, or enough in uh, a program to help people uh, uh, prevent, uh, prevent risk of addictions. Um, if we can invest uh, enough in a program to, to, to prevent uh, the spread of new variants of COVID, we can make a qualitative difference. It'll be like a game changer. It'll change the system from going to an endemic equilibrium where we're all dealing with COVID you know, uh, each risk, each year dealing with COVID risk, and it's a part of our daily lives decades from now, uh, versus a situation where, like smallpox, uh, and increasingly close to polio as well, it's driven to extinction. Um, and uh, with nonlinear systems, there is that opportunity to identify those tipping points, identify where it, it you know, enough investment will just tip the difference to, to be a, uh, a game changer. Um, but it takes judicious um, thinking based on models. And we'll see how those models can be used and why they can be used, for example, to anticipate how much vaccination do we need tip that balance so that a disease goes extinct in the population rather than continuing to circulate. And you'll see that the reason that people on nightly news or, or those stories uh, that you'll read will say, we need this fraction of the population vaccinated, okay? Um, so I'm gonna be teaching you material in the next few lectures um, that if only our decision makers uh, were to appreciate more broadly across Canada, um, it'll be a complete game changer for COVID-19 and other conditions, um, rather than leading us to this, uh, to this undesirable but all too likely future where we're going to be living with this endemically for generations um, and with new variants coming up periodically as for flu. So um, we're going to go through this the next few lectures. Um, and uh, starting next time, we should get you equipped for those final two problems on the, the problem set, okay, the, the assignment. Okay, so thank you very much. We're gonna have office hours again in about five minutes. Uh, this has been a very fast paced lecture and um, I'd like to welcome people to come there. Uh, I'm gonna save away the chat and see if I could answer some of those, uh, those questions during the subsequent session, okay? So thank you very much and I look forward to some seeing some of you in office or hours shortly. Take care there.